Okay, welcome again. Um, before I introduce Professor Piccolo, just a couple other words I'd like to thank. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, for their organizational support. I'd like to thank Maya Rancigai Benesh, the Slovene Lectrice here at uh, the School of Slavonic and East European Studies, uh, and also the Center for Slovene as a Second and Foreign Language at the University of Ljubljana. Um, and also, I'd like to thank the Embassy of the Republic of Slovenia in London for bringing us in touch with Professor Piccolo. Your name, Piccolo, is uh, a professor of political science at the University of Ljubljana. He's the author of numerous books and articles on political thought, on globalization, uh, on multiculturalism in contemporary Europe, and many other topics. And he has a long standing interest in uh, the use of metaphor in political language. And he uh, co edited a volume in English about 10 years ago called Political Language and Metaphor Interpreting and Changing the World. Um, and it's with these analytical tools that uh, he is now analyzing the present political situation. Uh, created by the COVID pandemic. And, and his uh, topic this evening is precisely that with a focus on the Slovene context. I should also mention that Professor Piccolo is uh, the former Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Slovenia, as well as the former Minister of Education, Science and Sport. So without further ado, I'd like to hand things over to Professor Piccolo. Uh, take it away. Thank you so much. Good evening to uh, everyone, to Professor Benesh and everyone that was uh, involved in making this uh, possible to, uh, to happen. I wanted to thank you all really for, uh, for coming to this, uh, for coming to this uh, lecture. I am. I have prepared about 45, uh, 45 minutes of uh, my thinking about uh, about metaphors and uh, how I see the uh, uh, the present uh, the present situation. But uh, before we go into this, I really wanted to say uh, to say a few thanks. Uh, first of all, to the School of Slavonic and East European uh, Studies. Um, I was delighted when I was contacted uh, uh, by them. Uh, so, because to me, UCL has always been an uh, institution that I found, uh, you know, extremely, extremely uh, academically um, high rated uh, institution. And it was always, it's, it's really a pleasure, I have to say, it's really a pleasure. That I can have uh, that I can have this uh, seminar with you, and my thanks, uh, obviously, uh, because they did most of the work, uh, goes to Professor Benesh, to Jakob and Maya uh, for doing this, uh, for making it uh, possible. But for the thoughts that I will be sharing uh, with you this uh, this evening, uh, it's also my students. I, I always. I always thank them because uh, they are the ones that uh, they are discussing issues. Uh, They're discussing issues with me. They're the ones that make uh, my thoughts uh, way clearer than they would otherwise uh, be. Be it here at my, uh, at my home institution at the Faculty of Social Sciences here in Ljubljana or at any other institution uh, that, I can make, uh, that I can make myself uh, you know, uh, through these webinars and uh, so on uh, present. And then last but uh, not least, it's the good friends. It's, uh, it's the good friends that are really encouragement uh, that, I have, uh, that I have in my life. And this is what makes me uh, not just proud, but they are the ones that are uh, really making uh, my life uh, way better than it would, otherwise, uh, it would otherwise be. My today's aim is really, I would say, uh, very much unfinished uh, work. This is uh, work in progress. Uh, this is something that I observe. This is something that's been under my observation uh, for year, two years, and so on. Uh, it's metaphors are something that I've been working with uh, for, I would say, a decade, uh, a decade or more. But the story or the stories, the context that I will be trying to explain to you 
this evening is really uh, a work in progress, very much unfinished work. Uh, I'm saying this because I'm looking forward to your comments uh, 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 at the end. My idea today is uh, rather simple, uh, is to show how politics is imagined and reimagined under the current COVID, uh, COVID conditions. Uh, the idea is to show you how our discourses, how our metaphors as parts of these courses actually influencing not just politics, but political decisions in general, uh, political agents, you know, all of those that, uh, that deal with politics, but at the end, it's the people that, uh, that are feeling uh, these effects that are either satisfied or dissatisfied or um, uh, whichever, uh, whichever opinion uh, uh, they take. So my idea is to uh, try to present how political in Slovenia, in this, in this very case in Slovenia, appears and uh, functions via, uh, via metaphors. I'll be later coming up with, uh, uh, with some metaphors. I'll show you how they function, why they function, or why they don't uh, function for uh, some matter. I want to show you really how can we steer politics? How can we steer politics with political discourse? How can we effectively use uh, metaphors in political discourse? to steer uh, the politics in this or that direction. This is nothing new. I have to say it's been, uh, it's been there since uh, I would say Aristotelian times uh, uh, at least. So it's a, it's, it's a known thing uh, how you make things with language. Uh, if, um, if no one else, it was the American uh, pragmatist tradition that uh, came up with a very, very simple, but also effective formula. And that is that in politics, we do things with words and concepts. And this is what I'll be analyzing. Uh, this is what I'll be analyzing uh, this evening. Uh, I will try to show you how do we do things and uh, how is this, uh, what does this mean? Um, what does this mean? I will also try to show you how and why uh, certain concepts, certain metaphors, certain, uh, I would say, contexts uh, appear at uh, certain times. There are times that they appear, but wouldn't appear at other times and so on. So, so it's a special, this, this time sensitive, this time sensitiveness that there is there to, uh, to metaphors and how they appear in, uh, in political discourse. And uh, finally, I will also uh, try to show you how can we change things? Uh, how can we change things uh, with, uh, with metaphors? With the, with the effective use of metaphors, namely, uh, we, can, uh, we, can change, uh, we can change quite a lot. But before we actually embark on this, uh, on this, uh, on this journey, I have some, uh, I have to say, I would say very unusual caveats. Uh, because usually uh, we don't uh, uh, we don't have to uh, we don't have to say this, but uh, because this is international audience and because people are not uh, that well aware uh, with uh, with the situation uh, maybe uh, maybe in Slovenia, uh, but also about my very personal uh, uh, about my very personal position. Uh, let me be clear on uh, on some things uh, so that we don't uh, so that we don't uh, so that you don't have a feeling that I'm trying to do uh, something else. First of all, uh, throughout the uh, throughout the presentation, throughout the lecture, I'll be trying to use the we language. Why the we language? Uh, it's because I don't want to uh, I don't want to put this I don't want this to be a debate on internal Slovenian political issues. Uh, this is not a debate on uh, this is not a debate on internal Slovenian political issues. Uh, if I want to debate this uh, politically, I have other fora. I don't have to use the academic uh, forum uh, for that. So uh, this is again, uh, as I'm saying, uh, this is not a debate on internal uh, Slovenian political issues. Neither is this debate about us and them and uh, you know whatever. Uh, 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 whatever, uh, whatever you take. This is also not a political debate. Uh, 
uh, this is a political science. Uh, this is a political science debate. Although yes, it talks about uh, it talks about politics. Uh, obviously, it talks about politics, but it's not uh, it's not a political uh, uh, political uh, debate. Of course, as Professor Benish has already uh, introduced me, uh, I am politically, and uh, hopefully, each and every one of us uh, is politically opinionated uh, person. I cherish that. Uh, I cherish that as a uh, as a as a as a personal. Uh, uh, political opinion, but it's not my intention, and I have absolutely no intention to use uh, uh, to use this uh, uh, this lecture to uh, put forward my very own uh, my very own political uh, political opinions. As I said, uh, I have enough uh, I have enough space, and there are other opportunities where I can talk uh, where I can talk politically. I've been academic for all of my uh, uh, for all of my life. Uh, this is what I do. Uh, this is what I do for a living. Uh, politics is something obviously that interests me. Uh, that interests me a lot. But uh, then again, uh, my heart and my profession is in the um, academia. So let us now go a little bit. I will take you to three uh, three stages. First stage, a little bit on, on metaphors, uh, a little bit about theory, a little bit about uh, the conceptions and, uh, and so on. Then we will move to something that is called contextualization. Uh, contextualization is primarily describing the context where Slovenian political metaphors uh, of COVID-19 are happening, what is the, uh, what is the uh, societal in, uh, um, uh, societal information, how is the, uh, how, what, what shape is society uh, currently and also political community and so on. And then I'll try to present, and this will be uh, obviously the analytical core uh, of uh, what I will be doing. Uh, I'll try to present you with um, different discourses. I'll try to present you, because uh, there is, it's not just one discourse uh, that would be dominant or anything, it's, it's, it's at least three or four that I can identify that are very strong uh, uh, discourses, uh, discourses in the current uh, COVID situation. But then there will be also about, um, it'll be about, uh, at the end, it'll be about a very particular uh, metaphors, uh, metaphor. And I'll try to show you, you know, why this is, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is actually so. Let us embark on the, uh, on the metaphor part. First of all, we are talking here, uh, I would say, a history of, uh, you know, uh, 500 years, uh, 500 years or more. Uh, it's not the earliest source that I have, but uh, Encyclopedia Britannica in its uh, 1771 edition. Uh, so the 18th century edition states that a metaphor is a trope by which we put a strange word for a uh, proper word. By metaphors, we usually mean rhetorical, uh, uh, rhetorical devices. These are uh, figures of speech, uh, if you want, uh, also of uh, poetic uh, imagination. Uh, primary, function, uh, primary function of the metaphors that we use is that sometimes we cannot imagine certain things. And then we use a concept from, from another domain from a natural world or from, uh, from any other domain to explain what is going on in, let's say, in social sciences domain. The most typical metaphor that I, uh, that I usually present to my, uh, to my students, and it's obvious to, uh, uh, to all of us, uh, to every one of us, is so-called metaphor of branches of government. We all know that there are, you know, uh, uh, we, and, and in everyday speak, we don't even notice that we are using the metaphor branches of uh, government. Uh, by the way, uh, when we don't notice that we're using the, uh, that we're using the actual metaphor, uh, this is what we call a death metaphor or a silent metaphor. It's the metaphor that we don't notice uh, e uh, anymore. Now in reality, we know that there are no branches. In reality, uh, we know that branches is something that belongs to the tree, to the bush, or anything from the, uh, from the natural world. But then again, we're helping ourselves. We're helping ourselves in our minds and our brains and, uh, and, and so on to imagine how this is done uh, in, three, in three parts of the, uh, of the government. So judicial, 
parliamentary, and then of course the uh, and then of course the uh, executive. That's that's all fine, and but that's only uh, the part one. That's only the part one when we actually do the description, when we do uh, when we do the so-called descriptive part of the metaphor. So you're describing with I don't know with with branches of government. You're actually describing the three uh, the three parts uh, the three parts of the government. But the interesting part comes when we actually start to think that this is so. And this is something that uh, we know uh, now for, 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 for quite some time, and it's called ontologically creative uh, type of metaphor. It's called ontologically creative metaphors because metaphors, they don't just describe, they also prescribe, they also create. And this is the part that interests me. It's not so much the description of uh, what is going on. It's not, not so much that there are branches uh, of government. It's actually what, what, when we use the word, when you use the metaphor, branches of government, what does this do to our minds? How do we think about politics in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this way? So this is something that is in, um, in theory. Uh, this is known as ontologically creative, uh, or if you want a performative, or a poetic function, also a poetic function of, uh, of uh, metaphors. Because metaphors, they, they do something. They bridge the unbridgeable gap between meaning and reality. Because you know, with words, we can never describe, uh, we can never describe fully uh, realities. So we need, uh, we need proxies. And uh, metaphors work as, uh, as, these, uh, as these proxies. But here, I want you to draw your attention or maybe remember this, uh, this point. And that is that metaphors are not just, it's not, we don't use them just for description, but we rather use them. And this is, this is, some, this is to me the most important uh, part to take, uh, to take away. And that is that they are creative, that they perform and, um, and uh, they make certain things viable certain things visible and the others uh, and the others uh, not. Here it is um, it is important uh, maybe uh, maybe to note is something that is called a power relations. Namely, it's not everyone that is authorized to speak. There are only, I'm not going to say certain persons, but certain persons speak from a uh, podium of authority speak from a podium of power, speak from a podium of academia, and so on. So it's, it, it matters. It matters who is using the metaphors. It very, much, it, it very much matters who is speaking about metaphors, but also who is defining the metaphors. This is, this is, this is something that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's, always, that's always important. In politics, we know. In politics, we're well aware that the uh, effective use of metaphors. You see, if you know how to use metaphors effectively, you can actually steer politics uh, with it. Uh, you can do, uh, you know, you can you can win uh, you can win election campaigns. You can do all sorts of uh, 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 all sorts of things. Remember. Remember the uh, the slogan, if you want, but in reality it was a metaphor from the uh, from let's say from the Obama campaign, when he was saying, "Yes, we can." I mean, that was um, that was a reference to uh, George Bush uh, Jr., but also you know that was a reference to uh, what he can do and and so on. So it's not uh, my point here is that uh, metaphors, if used and utilized effectively. They can do. Uh, they can do, and this is the American pragmatism. They can really do a lot. Uh, they can do really do a lot in in politics. Now, metaphors are are not in the. Uh, you know, they they're, they're not just out there somewhere in uh, out of the. Uh, you know, in in the. Uh, I don't know, uh, in the thin air or in the in the in the empty empty space. They're always they're always contextualized. And social and political contexts, they play, they actually play a major role. They're, 
you know, metaphors, the way we use them, the way we effectively use them, they're always embedded. We, we say that they are embedded in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the context. This is how we transfer uh, knowledge. One of my colleagues, a great colleagues, I have to say from the Cambridge University, um, uh, she, uh, she talks or she developed the concept of so-called hubs or nodes, you know, where, uh, where, where metaphor acts act as nodes, you know, where, where, where different things are coming together, but everything is, uh, is uh, uh, contextualized. Number four, we usually forget, or we sometimes, I have to say, we, we, also, we also neglect readers. Why do we why do we neglect audience? Because you know when I started uh, working with metaphors, when I started uh, uh, analyzing, uh, researching uh, on uh, on metaphors, there was barely any research done on the uh, uh, on the audience. But audience, if you want uh, people, subjects, uh, you know, uh, uh, citizens, uh, whichever audience. Uh, you actually, uh, you actually has. They are critical for the reception of metaphor. If someone wants a metaphor to be effective, then he or she needs to know a great deal, really, really a great deal about the audience. Because sometimes, you know, we just don't take the audience. We take audience for granted. But an audience is not for granted as such, because audience has knowledge, audience has uh, what we call either uh, explicit knowledge or tacit knowledge, but they also have something that's called a cognitive scheme, uh, a cognitive scheme. And if you're able to address that cognitive scheme, then you're able to, then your, your metaphor will be uh, way more, uh, way more effective. Now, as I'm saying, uh, as I'm saying this, you will think, okay, this is all rational process. You will, you will think, um, okay, we just figure out, uh, you know, we just figure out metaphor and then we win the elections or we do this or we do that politically. It's not that easy because with audience, uh, it's, not just, uh, it's not just how this reception is not just, uh, uh, this reception is way from uh, being just rational. There is always something that we call ethos, logos and pathos. So it's ethical, but it's also, obviously it's logical, but then it's also about passion. It's also about the, uh, it's also about the emotions that we put or emotions that uh, metaphors address. You will see these, these little bits and pieces. You will see how important they are and they were in uh, informing uh, the current Slovenian COVID-19, if you want, uh, uh, political, uh, uh, political uh, discourse. And maybe, and maybe number, uh, and maybe number five, um, which is effectiveness. So I was already saying that these metaphors are not, uh, are not effective in the, uh, in the same way. If we want to use them effectively, we have to take a lot of things uh, into uh, into the uh, into the uh, into the equation. But a wrong metaphor at a wrong time, not just that it has no effect, it can actually have an opposite or detrimental effect to what you are trying to uh, to what you're trying to achieve. I'll also try to show you a little bit of that. Uh, a little bit of that uh, uh, this evening. So this is, these are just the little bits and pieces. I'm sorry to be, uh, you know, to be so so sketchy uh, uh, in uh, in a sense, but uh, um, I sense that um, I sense that uh, you know uh, most of you are aware of uh, of uh, of the metaphors. It's just that. Uh, maybe uh, you haven't uh, attended any of the courses or been uh, taught in a very, uh, in a very structured uh, way about uh, what metaphors do. But otherwise, each and every one of us knows about metaphors from, uh, from, uh, from everyday life. So let us move, let us move on uh, a little bit on the, uh, 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 to the contextualization, uh, to the contextualization um, issue. 
Um, when I was asked to do this, I said, okay, um, I can do uh, a 10 year. I can do, you know, I can do, uh, I can propose a topic. I can propose various topics. But then again, I, I, I said to myself, okay, let me challenge myself. Let me reflect a little bit deeper than I usually do. Let me reflect of what is going on in, 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 in our society. And I'm, I'll be talking about Slovenian society uh, uh, now as a, as a contextualization. Uh, obviously, I will be letting out, you know, I will be, uh, I will be uh, omitting, uh, uh, so to speak, a number of things. Uh, Slovenians that are present, I know that uh, a lot of you are, uh, are on, this, uh, uh, on this Zoom, you will, have, you will have a different experience. Uh, obviously, it's uh, it's my experience. It's my uh, it's my contextualization. But then I I I really try to challenge uh, uh, to challenge myself uh, uh, in this political uh, political sense and uh, maybe think about it a little bit uh, a little bit deeper. Now, what happened? Um, uh, what happened in Slovenia? Uh, I would say uh, at the beginning of uh, of 2020 was a, uh, a, a change, uh, was a change of uh, government. Uh, so these two processes, actually, this is my, my first point, that the processes of uh, dealing with uh, coronavirus and processes of dealing with COVID-19 uh, almost coincide, it's not completely, but almost coincide with the uh, with the change of government in March of uh, of uh, of two thousand and uh, of two thousand and twenty. Now, previous uh, uh, central left uh, government resigned. Uh, here, it's the uh, disclaimer. I was part of that. Uh, I was part of that government. Uh, but I think I can be very critical, really, uh, uh, very critical uh, about it. Uh, what led to this? Uh, what led to this resignation was actually infighting. It was it was the governmental infighting. So the, the five political parties were uh, infighting about uh, health insurance, about the uh, about the future of uh, about the future of uh, health insurance. This was from the uh, from the very beginning, which was in 2019. It was a very uh, fragile uh, fragile coalition. And after the, the left, that is the political party that's called uh, left, left the, uh, the coalition, it actually became a minority, uh, uh, minority coalition. It was led by, uh, uh, by relatively inexperienced, uh, uh, inexperienced uh, uh, prime minister. Uh, but the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest problem was that none of the five political parties uh, in the parliament had more than 13% uh, share of the seats. So this was a very fragile, um, fragile from the uh, from the very uh, from the very beginning, and uh, this was you know when as as the COVID was coming, but uh, some people would say you know there would there would be some interpretation that it was actually the COVID that made uh, the uh, central left uh, government to resign. It wasn't. This was this was fragile before that. This was fragile in the months uh, up to the new year of 2020, and it was fragile also in January and February. So, uh, uh, and the uh, and the very thing that actually brought this uh, to the end uh, was infighting, as I already said about uh, about uh, health insurance. So, uh, two coalition partners decided to join new center right uh, uh, coalition. And this was already after the first cases of COVID uh, were detected in Slovenia. That, that was in the beginning of March, end of uh, February, when people started coming from holidays in, uh, in mainly in Italy, from skiing holidays in Italy. And also after the first two schools were actually closed and that closed and that was already, uh, that was happening in, uh, in, in the beginning of uh, March uh, 2020. So after that, a new government, uh, a new government was formed, and it was formed by the uh, by the central uh, right coalition. Now this government was different because it wasn't so fragile because it had one uh, and still has uh, one dominant political uh, party, 
and then uh, and all the other uh, and all the other partners are junior are junior partners in this uh, uh, in this uh, coalition. So it was different. Uh, it was different from the uh, from the previous one, which was more fragmented. In comparison with uh, with this one, that is uh, that is where you have one dominant political party, and then uh, all the other uh, all the other partners are actually junior uh, are actually junior political parties. If there is one thing that is that runs in the, um, if I may use again the metaphor, uh, that runs in the DNA uh, of the government, or the government wants to wanted to project from the uh, from the very beginning, and I'm explaining you this because this is contextualization. It's the effectiveness. That is that it wants to be effective in dealing with uh, with uh, COVID nineteen. And it was also in this effectiveness, uh, it was also the seriousness, the seriousness of the situation. Government wanted to give uh, and also gave, uh, it, has to be, uh, it has to be set to the people that were scared. Uh, uh, obviously, everyone was, uh, was scared because of, the, uh, uh, because of the pandemic. So it was about seriousness uh, of the situation. The seriousness of the, of, the, uh, of the situation was very graphically uh, really shown at uh, when first pictures of the, uh, of the, of the, of the meeting of the new government where, where they were all sitting with, uh, with masks and, uh, and so on. But that was, you know, it was, it was a kind of a message uh, it was a kind of a message to the people. Uh, I would say this was non-literal metaphor, but it was it was a message to the people that situation is uh, serious, and that we need to uh, we need to address uh, the situation in the uh, in the most uh, in the most effective uh, effective um, way. Now, when you look at the discourses, um, I see at least four. Uh, uh, I would say uh, I would say uh, four different uh, four different discourses that were or have been going on uh, in Slovenia for the past uh, for the past uh, year and uh, year and something. First would be official discourse, then it would be uh, something that would be called a public discourse, which is different than the uh, then the official discourse, and then it's the discourse by the uh, by the political uh, by the political opposition. I'll try to uh, to show you bits and pieces of each and every uh, of each and every part uh, of the of the discourse. As already said, the the aim, the goal, uh, if you want uh, a metaphor to uh, to look at. It's the it's the effectiveness. If we're looking at the uh, official uh, official discourse, uh, the projection that the government wanted to uh, wanted to do because it was dealing with a, with a very difficult uh, with a very difficult uh, situation was to show to the people that they are in charge of the uh, that they are in charge of the situation. And that they, you know, that they would, uh, that they're taking it, uh, they're taking it very seriously, and that they're a very effective, uh, a very effective way. Maybe another symbolic, uh, uh, symbolic move uh, was hiring uh, actually someone who was a speaker uh, for the uh, Slovenian independence, because as you know, in Slovenia had a 10-day uh, ten conflict with the Yugoslav army, uh, so-called independence, uh, so independence war. And uh, this person was in charge uh, 30 years back and was in charge of the communication now. In essence, what they were trying to achieve, what they were trying to do is draw some comparisons, uh, draw some lines uh, that people would get this, uh, people would get this feeling, you know, that we are dealing with the same kind of crisis, that we are dealing with the same kind of uh, crisis situation where we need to be, uh, where we need to be very, very, uh, very, very effective. Um, it was also uh, where uh, some of the, and this is not just in Slovenia, because I looked at some of the other, you know, for, for, the, comparative, uh, for the comparative reasons, uh, I have looked at uh, at some of the other uh, at some of the other states, but this is where this uh, military vocabulary, this is where military uh, metaphors that I'll be using uh, later on, like fight, struggle, war, threat, 
and uh, and uh, and so on. This is where this appears in the uh, uh, where this appears in the uh, in the in the vocabulary, or in the uh, or in the uh, or in the discourse. It's actually this military vocabulary that is uh, used that wasn't used before, but that is used uh, very very often since the uh, uh, since the beginning of the uh, of the COVID crisis. But then there is also another one, and that is the medicinal, that is the uh, medical, uh, medical vocabulary uh, uh, that was used, uh, that was used uh, uh, quite often for, again, as a metaphor, uh, where you would bring medical terms uh, for the, uh, for the societal, uh, for the societal uh, measures. Now, in my analysis, what was the, what was the idea? What was the uh, you know what was the idea uh, of these uh, of these political uh, um, of these of these metaphors that were uh, so military, medicinal, but also drawing these uh, uh, these comparisons and uh, so on. It was uh, it was twofold. First, it was to set the stage for uh, measures. In other words, to prepare uh, uh, to prepare the people. You know, there were measures like in every other country. There were measures that were connected to COVID, uh, you know, uh, because you had to maintain, and uh, it, it was a, it was a crisis uh, situation, if you want, and the public needed to uh, needed to understand uh, what is uh, uh, what is going on, and there were measures that were connected uh, that were connected to COVID, and there is no doubt about it that the government uh, needed uh, needed to do. But there were also measures that were not connected to COVID. And where some of the commentators, uh, where, where some of the commentators, are actually saying that this was uh, that the situation was used. Now, this is this is up uh, up for the debate. It's also something that uh, we're still debating in our uh, in our newspapers, in a public debates, and uh, so on. Whether actually this situation was used also for other political measures. For other political measures that would otherwise uh, also be introduced, even if there was no uh, if there was no uh, uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen, how do we know that they are not connected to? Uh, how do we know that they are not connected to COVID nineteen? Because we know reports from the groups of scientists, where the groups of these reports were made public, and then the scientists are saying something, but. Then again, uh, as a measure, something else is uh, is is taken off. As I said, in comparative in comparative perspective, when you look at uh, when you look at in comparison with UK, Germany, France, roughly, you know, uh, uh, I have to say something similar. Uh, something similar is happening, although the degrees of you know how uh, how strong this is is actually uh, is actually changing. Then another thing, another. Uh, another part that I see uh, as, as changing is that a political discourse, you will, you will say, what, you know, isn't, isn't in politics always political discourse? No, because in Slovenia for the past, I would say 20 years, since 2000s, this managerial discourse was predominant in politics. Here and now, it was replaced by a more political, uh, more political, less managerial, but more, uh, but more political uh, discourse, where societies or political communities also uh, also differ, is how they communicate. Uh, obviously, with uh, with their uh, with their citizens, is it asking, is it pleading, or is it ordering? You know, there are there are huge differences. Uh, there are huge differences uh, among the uh, approaches, and I'm mentioning this. I am mentioning this because uh, this is because it makes a reaction from the people. It's something if you're asking them, it's something if you're pleading with them, but it's something else if in this situation you're actually giving orders. Uh, so this this needs to be uh, this needs to be further analyzed to see how why some societies, why some political communities have done it better. Is it because is it because they had other communication strategies? Is it because they were using different metaphors, metaphors of unity, 
metaphors of, uh, uh, I, I don't know, of, of a body politic and so on, whereby you emphasize this unity, this, this wholeness and so on, instead of war, struggle, fight, uh, uh, crisis, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera. You see, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you threaten people, if you, uh, if you say, if you say to the people, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, uh, then people have difficulty to identify, uh, to identify with, uh, with that. And they, they tend to rebel. And we have, uh, we have seen this on, uh, on the streets of many European, but also other capitals, of many European capitals, including, of course, uh, including, of course, Ljubljana. So that was a kind of official discourse. Now the, uh, the public discourse. The public discourse was split. This is kind of a, uh, uh, as the public opinion is split, so much is the, uh, is, the, is the political discourse that the public does is split, but I would also say very much along the political affiliations that, that, are, uh, that are there. Here may be two things. In the first wave of COVID-19, I think uh, more people happily, well happily, no one did it happily, but more people followed governmental guidelines uh, out of, I would say, fear, but I would, uh, but I would also say out of conviction that if we go along, if we do it together, if we, you know, if we, if, if we, if we do that, we'll be, uh, we'll be fine. During the second wave, which was in the autumn of 2020, there were more doubts, more rebellion, less identification, and so on. Why? Because people had issues, because they saw that there are all kinds of, uh, that there are all kinds of, you know, uh, slips, I would say, by either the members of the government or, or, or any, any others, like businessmen and so on. And then people had trouble identifying because people said, you know, if he can do it, why can't I do it? If she can do it, why I can do it and so on. So they had, they had in the second wave, we had more problems with, uh, uh, more problems with the uh, uh, identification. Now the political opposition had its own uh, uh, discourse. Uh, again, uh, as I was saying, uh, as I was saying before, um, although this is politically speaking, this is something that would be dear uh, or something that, that I would be closer uh, to, I can be very critical and I can say that political opposition was unable to produce a coherent discourse. This is, this is, this is clear. Uh, political opposition was also unable to produce metaphors, metaphors that would talk to you know, their, uh, their supporters. Opposition was torn between the health issues and the opposition to the, uh, uh, to the government. And I have to say that it took quite some time, uh, the opposition, it took quite some time to figure, out, uh, to figure out that it's very unproductive to go against health measures that, you know, they can criticize other measures, but uh, that it's rather unproductive to go, uh, to go against, uh, to, to go against uh, these, uh, these uh, measures. I will slowly draw to a, uh, to a conclusion by showing you the consequences of the metaphors uh, that are there in a, uh, in a society. We talked about fight. We talked about struggle. We talked about war against COVID where enemy is invisible, enemy is omnipresent, enemy is deadly. Uh, there is threat, there is, uh, uh, there is, uh, there is crisis and, um, and uh, so on. But this COVID situation brought up also, uh, I would say, almost Hobbesian, uh, Hobbesian tension between uh, freedom and, uh, and security. We all know that uh, from the 17th uh, century on, uh, individuals in political discourses were mainly imagined, uh, uh, were mainly imagined as atoms, as, you know, as these uh, alone particles, uh, because you had a free sovereign, uh, you had a free sovereign individual. 
Before it was, it was this body politic. It was a, an, an organic perception of what is going on where we were all part of one body. From the 17th century on with liberalism, with Hobbes, Locke and, uh, and so on, we, move, uh, we moved uh, out of this and we move into the atomic. We call it atomic perception, uh, atomized really, uh, perception of, uh, of individuals. Now, uh, Thomas Hobbes has this tension between freedom and security. It's the social contract uh, whereby people trade uh, uh, freedom for, uh, uh, for security that is, uh, that is making life for them uh, a little bit uh, easier. And because of this conception, because of this metaphor of atoms and uh, so on, uh, it shows how limits of my freedom is limited with the freedom of the others. We still say that when we, when we explain about freedom to, uh, to youngsters, when we explain about freedom to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, um, you know, to students, uh, one of the conceptions, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if we go through Isaiah Berlin's uh, um, kind of list, one of the conceptions uh, would be that limits of my freedom uh, is limited by the, uh, by the limited of the others. But in COVID, this situation radically changes. You see, the others are not limits anymore. The others can be bearers of virus. And so they become, and I'll exaggerate a bit, they become deadly enemies. You see, the others are not your compatriots. The others, the others in, in, in this situation, you see, and uh, the, the, uh, the others, are not about, uh, you know, the, 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 the others are not about, um, how should I say, that we live together, that we have, uh, that we have made ourselves uh, possible that we can, uh, so that, uh, you know, that we can, uh, that we can, uh, that we can live together. We have learned how to take risks for our well-being, health, disease, and so on. This is legacy of the uh, enlightenment. But you see virus, brings a completely different situation where we say let us let us distance ourselves from the uh, from the others it's not that the others are friends it's not that the others but they can potentially i'm exaggerating this for the uh, for the sake of the discussion but they can they can potentially be uh, be deadly uh, uh, deadly enemies so you see these atoms they must distance themselves from the other atoms. It's not that they would come together and form something bigger. It's they have to separate themselves from the other in order, uh, in order, uh, in order uh, not to die. And why is this important? And I will, uh, I will, uh, I will definitely, uh, I will definitely uh, finish here. This is important because uh, in 250 years or more, sorry, uh, and more. Uh, of the enlightenment. We have, we have learned how to live, uh, how to live uh, with each other. We have learned how to rely on each other, with each other, and uh, so on. This is where our democracies actually, uh, this is where our democracies actually rest. They rest on the trust towards the others, they rest on trusting, uh, trusting us as a community, but then also us as individuals. And uh, if we take the lesson of, the, uh, of this atomic structure, if we take the lesson of this atoms and how the discourses are and were formed, we have to, we, we see that we need to make for the future, and I'm talking about the future, we have to, we, we will have to think very hard about how to rebuild common public spaces where people will trust each other. What kind of new forms of democratic cooperation we can have? This will be, this will be, this will be our task. It's a huge challenge. 
but it's also an opportunity because the COVID and the metaphors that we're using and the contextualization that was there, it has given us enough food for thought, but not just food for thought, it has given us enough reflection where we can reflect on what we have learned since the enlightenment and before, and whether a new foundations, new democratic foundation based on trust and uh, how this can be done, whether we can take it, uh, uh, whether we can take it uh, from there. It's about looking forward. It's about changing the metaphor. It's about coming up with new metaphor that will, uh, that will correspond to the time that we are living and whereby we will be able and would be able to create different, even more democratic, based on, based on trust, new public spaces, where uh, where all of us would be would feel uh, would feel welcome, but would also be our our legacy, so to speak, to um, to our uh, to our children. So I will um, I will stop uh, I will stop here. I would like to thank you for uh, for listening to me. Uh, as I know, we have. Uh, quite a lot of time uh, uh, we have quite a lot of time to uh, for the uh, for the Q&A but uh, back to professor Benish and uh, he will be uh, he will be the one leading the uh, leading the discussion thank you well thank you very much professor Piccolo for that um, very thought provoking talk uh, i think um, if we were in the Masaryk right now, Masaryk room right now at uh, the Cease building uh, uh, in Tabaton Street in Bloomsbury, we'd all give uh, Professor Pico a, a hearty round of applause. Um, and it's not really over to me now because uh, it's now over to the audience for, for question and discussion. So as I said before, uh, if you have questions, please uh, write, I have a question in the chat, um, or if you're not um, able to ask the question directly. You can also write the question into the chat function. Um, while we're waiting for uh, people to collect their thoughts and, and pose questions, um, a couple things occurred to me um, that might kick off some discussion here this evening. And uh, the first is about uh, comparison. And I'm wondering if uh, it might not be useful here, I'm speaking uh, as a historian because I, because I am a historian, uh, it might not be useful to think comparatively also back in time. And I wonder when was the last time these kind of martial or bellicose metaphors uh, characterized Slovenian political discourse and whether there's something maybe instructive to be learned from comparing the present uh, kind of saturation of public and political discourse with such metaphors to when this happened in the past. And uh, that kind of leads me to uh, a second kind of question or, or thought that I, that I had, and that's, that's thinking, about, um, thinking about kind of how these metaphors of struggle and fight and, you know, the, the, the Boris Johnson administration talking about the battle plan and things like that, you know, how, how that might work in different societies. And, and, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, to say that there hasn't been, um, hasn't been a lot of kind of social fragment, social political fragmentation in the UK. There has been, but I'd say less so than in, in Slovenia. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I wonder. I wonder if um, the different kind of trajectories of these um, of, of of this sort of political discourse, which is actually in some ways kind of similar, whether these different trajectories might not reflect different experiences with war in these countries. And and what I mean is that you know the last big war that both, let's say, the UK and Slovenia were involved in. Uh, you know, experienced directly. The Second World War uh, was was very different um, in in each place. You know, in 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 the UK, uh, in in a way, it was kind of unifying. Uh, whereas in Slovenia, it arguably was exactly the opposite. And uh, you know, there was um, 
and, and you know, what you said at the end there about sort of the others in the time of COVID becoming kind of, you know, not, not necessarily objects of solidarity or friends and neighbors, but actually maybe deadly others. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like the, the period 1941 to 1945 in Slovenia, where, you know, you, you, you have the occupying forces, you have the partisans, the collaborationist forces, a lot of people caught in, in between. And so, you know, in, in a way, war metaphors kind of summon divisiveness maybe in, in Slovenian uh, uh, sort of minds and in, in, in Slovenian um, society in, in, in a way that they don't in, let's say, Britain. Uh, and then you might have other cases. Um, but basically, I'm, I'm both questions. I'm, I'm thinking kind of how, how we might um, uh, 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 consider this, this theme of bellicose metaphors under COVID in a kind of longer historical um, uh, perspective. So, um, well, I, I, I don't see other questions flowing in at the moment, but maybe if, 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 you, have, if, if, if you have a couple thoughts on, on what I just said, you're, you're welcome to uh, jump in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> um, you're right uh, about most, uh, I would say about, um, about, you know, about uh, uh, metaphors, uh, metaphors, bellicose uh, metaphors uh, being used. Uh, that they have sometimes a unifying, but also sometimes, you know, uh, diversifying, uh, uh, diversifying effects that, and then it's the, uh, it's the collective experience that is actually, uh, uh, that is actually, but my point, um, I don't know, I, uh, I have to say, uh, I'll be very frank, I didn't do the, uh, the historical, uh, the historical comparison, uh, the historical comparison so much. I was uh, primarily focused on um, on uh, on these unifying or diversifying uh, diversifying effects that is here and uh, has been uh, has been there. Now, uh, my where I see uh, probably the most important consequence. Let's take it. Let's take it that way. Is is where we have real time, uh, where we have uh, real, not in real time, but real, you know, in uh, consequences, uh, in, in uh, real consequences. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by real consequences? It's the, uh, you know, you can use metaphors. Uh, you can use this or that, and we have different, as you're saying, different historical experience uh, uh, by them. But then, uh, it's they have a important effect on reality. Let's say I'm, I'm looking at how you in the UK, I'm, I'm following a bit, how you in the UK are doing the vaccination, uh, the vaccination uh, uh, process. Uh, as far as I see, uh, but I'm, again, I'm, I'm, not that, uh, uh, I'm not that versed in the discourse, but as far as I see, we, let's say we, have a way more discussion about AstraZeneca and you know the pros and cons and you know all of us is all you know all each and every one of us is almost a medical expert uh, these days you know on vaccines and you know what can be done and can't be done and who should get it and why it should be getting it and so on while in comparison you in the UK you're far more effective and the rolling out of the vaccination process has only been probably one of the most effective in the world. And you see, we're debating. We, we have, as you were saying, we have this, uh, this, 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 this tendency of analyzing, overanalyzing, uh, you know, and then also splitting, and then also splitting in our opinion. And that makes it less effective than it could be in comparison, let's say, with yours, where public discussion obviously is very rich. But I have to say, on these terms, you are way more, uh, you're way more effective. And this is a real time, uh, this is a real uh, consequence in real terms. Uh, and uh, I attribute it uh, very much to the discourse, the metaphors uh, that, are, uh, that are being used, the usual divisiveness or unity in, in society, as you're saying, 
it could be uh, it could be a historical consequence as uh, uh, as as uh, you're also uh, as you're also uh, saying yes so um, those those are as I said uh, to me this this whole uh, you know how to do things with words and uh, here you have a dire need to do things and that is to vaccinate to 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 prevent the spread of disease and uh, and and so on so you should be effective as uh, uh, as much as possible thank you uh questions from the floor please come forward and uh ask professor piccolo uh any any questions related to his talk um in the meantime, maybe I could just follow up briefly and, and ask, I, I, I thought your um, discussion, your ther theoretical discussion was, was, was really interesting at the beginning. And, and I, I completely agree with you that, that um, you know, political, well, that, that language, discourse, and, and more specifically, um, metaphors used within discourses, you know, not only not only sort of describe reality or an intended to describe reality, but in some ways kind of create reality, right? They, they, they in, in the sense that they create meaning, they, they, they structure the world around us, uh, being able to, to uh, describe it verbally in writing gives it meaning, right? And, and in that sense, metaphors are, are creative, as you said. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, uh, which metaphors in the past year would you say have been most kind of creative of, of a new reality, of a new kind of um, uh, uh, way of seeing the world, let's say? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you also for this. Um, I would say uh, these, uh, these two sets, uh, one would be uh, bellicose military uh, uh, set of from the, from the vocabulary because it's a whole set, you know, war, struggle, battle, um, uh, plan, a military plan, uh, you know, all, all, all sorts of uh, those things. And then it's the, um, it's the medicalization, uh, medicalization of the, uh, of the, uh, of the discourse. Here maybe it's uh, uh, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit uh, less um, less important, uh, uh, but then again this was something that wasn't uh, so much present in the uh, in the uh, in the public domain, and uh, it's the medical discourse that is actually uh, influencing you know all the policies. Uh, uh, all the measures that are being taken in, in a variety of other uh, in a variety of other areas. So it's the uh, it's the discourse that is that is shaping our other uh, other policies and that has a that has a, a prescriptive ontologically creative effect if you want on the uh, on the other uh, on the other uh, on the other areas. Um, so uh, to me, those are two. Uh, uh, those are two of the most important uh, sets of uh, of uh, of uh, I would say uh, uh, metaphors that are actually uh, doing. But then again, uh, but then again, maybe one more thing, and uh, and that is uh, this atomization, this this individualization, uh, uh, if you want, uh, in 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 our words. We would say social distancing. Uh, in reality, it was all about physical distancing. Uh, uh, it was about not spreading. Uh, it was uh, about not spreading the uh, uh, the, the virus. Um, but uh, this has kind of made us aware of uh, of what is going. Um, I would say. I would say. You know. It made us aware, as I was thinking also this afternoon about it, it made us aware of the genealogy of what our democracies have become before COVID. Because it 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 it, it lays very bare, you know, uh, you know, in 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 a plain sight uh, what was uh, what was actually there and uh, what are we missing with uh, what are we missing in COVID and what is also a potential uh, way forward. Indeed, yes, and uh, I, I think uh, a, a 
question that's relevant to that topic has just come in through the chat from Jana Javornik. Thank you very much, Jana. And she writes, uh, thanks for this inspiring talk. Building on from Jakub, political metaphors are characterized by their variability and contentiousness. Thus, might you elaborate on the persuasive power of metaphor and new meaning nuances in audience reception pre and during the, pan the epidemic in Slovenia? Is there any change to the use of the war metaphor in Slovene political reality in these two points in time? Thank you, Jana, so much uh, uh, for this uh, uh, for this question. Uh, first of all, uh, what one can observe is that uh, these metaphors were almost not present or less present uh, pre-COVID uh, uh, pre-COVID times. So, uh, if you look at how uh, how this was uh, how our public discourse. Uh, was structured. Uh, it wasn't uh, in a sense of these bellicose, uh, uh, bellicose military, uh, medical, uh, medical, uh, medical metaphors. So, in essence, that is uh, uh, that is new, and this was something that wasn't there pre uh, pre epidemic. And I also think uh, there will be some, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to, uh, to foresee the future, but uh, I think the power of metaphor, because Jan is also asking the, about the power, of the, uh, the power of the metaphor, I think it'll change. Uh, once we are, uh, we're done with the, uh, with, the COVID, uh, with the COVID situation, there will be lessons uh, we have learned, not just in medical way, not just in ways of organizing our societies or medical ways of organizing societies, but also in, in terms of organizing, uh, politically organizing or socially organizing things. So uh, I guess, uh, as, I was already, uh, as I was already saying, uh, we will be needing, we might be needing and uh, so on. Uh, new and uh, nuances, uh, uh, if you want, uh, if you want, on uh, on political uh, on political uh, metaphor. Now about the audience reception. Uh, my take with the uh, with the audience reception, I wanted to illustrate with wave one and wave uh, two. Wave one with the uh, wave one of the COVID uh, was, I think, the reception was uh, less uh, was more wel welcome. You know, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was. Uh, I would say better. Uh, let's put it. Uh, let's put it this way. While in the uh, second wave, when these metaphors have kind of. Uh, Taken their uh, their uh, you know not not just their grip but when they have they have they they have become more powerful they have they got uh, they got they got they got more uh, more power. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, 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 this is where also there was bigger uh, rebellion uh, because uh, people obviously reacted. People uh, reacted also to some uh, to some events that uh, that happened and were uh, were kind of um, uh, I would say out of the line uh, as it uh, as it should have been under the under the rules. But I guess everywhere was uh, was uh, was the same. So uh, uh, second point about the audience reception, I would say uh, in the second wave. Uh, these metaphors were less welcomed. Uh, more, there was more, uh, more, um, more. They, people were more negative about it, which you can very easily see also in public opinion, because there was a swing in uh, in public opinion, uh, quite a lot against uh, you know against uh, the use, but also uh, against the measures. Uh, I would say that uh, were being introduced. During the uh, during the uh, during the second wave. Thank you. Um, and now I think uh, Dushan Rebel would like to ask a question about uh, Hobbesian metaphors. Uh, Dushan, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, uh, thank you for the um, presentation. Now, um, my question um, is roughly this. Now. We've heard about the, you know, sort of the martial form of 
of metaphor there, that was employed by the current Slovenian government. And this is, of course, in line with their style of politics, which harkens very much back to either Carl Schmitt or the, or the original Hobbesian um, conception of politics, where the sort of the main purpose of politics actually is to, uh, is to secure the populace with the Leviathan being, of course, the, the big foundational metaphor for the uh, power of the state. Now, on the other hand, to communicate the proper forms of behavior during the COVID crisis, you basically need very lucid descriptions, almost sort of game theoretic descriptions of how people must come together and coordinate to their, be, their behavior with a proper uh, modicum sort of, of trust in order to collectively reach a successful outcome. So given that that's the case, does this indicate that there are limitations to the use of metaphor in politics, that there may be times to resort to less metaphoric and perhaps more exact forms of communication? So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I wanted to thank uh, Dushan. Uh, I have to say it's been what fifteen. Uh, maybe I have to. Years. I think it's it's more since the undergraduate days. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true. True. Uh, so uh, hi, if I may use this uh, opportunity, and obviously thank you so much for the uh, uh, for the question. Um, I would say you're right. Uh, I would say uh, you're you're right, but with two or three uh, with two or three things that we have to we have to take into uh, into the account. If the discourse was only rational, then obviously uh, using non-metaphorical, straight uh, straightforward uh, would be the way to do it. Uh, if it was only if it was only rational, and then and even then, you have to assume that all the listeners are uh, have the same level of uh, tacit knowledge, that they have the same background, uh, you know, uh, 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 structures uh, in their in their minds, and they and they are taking the unifying uh, the unifying message. But that never happens. And I agree with you. With metaphors, it's even it's even more haze type. But what metaphors allow you is that in in a very simple uh, in a very simple terms, people can get the message because they can domesticate the message. They can um, they can they can they can translate if you want. They can they can translate the message. In their own uh, in their own cognitive uh, in their own cognitive scheme, and uh, I guess it's uh, it's effective. But otherwise, I have to say I agree with you uh, on on a rational plane. On a rational plane, it's a straightforward uh, it's a straightforward language. It's something that um, uh, it's something that we need to uh, it's something that we need to uh, do. But then again, I also spoke about pathos and uh, you know and ethos. And this is where uh, I don't know if, if if a purely rational or you know that that sort of uh, that sort of discourse would make uh, uh, would make um, would make things. If if I was in if if I were in a political position, uh, I guess uh, what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to suggest this would be this would be my take. This would be you know to to be as uh, as less metaphoric as straightforward as possible as uh, as doing it. But then again. You know, you have to make sure that all people understand that they can translate into their own quote unquote language, and uh, that they can take it that they can take it away. What is what kind of behavior is needed uh, is actually uh, is actually needed from uh, from them in order to contain the um, uh, the uh, the uh, the epidemic. But but again, thank you so much for pointing this out because uh, straightforward might might. Uh, be uh, be way more effective. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, now we have uh, two more questions from the audience. Maybe we can uh, I can read them both out and and 
uh, Professor Piccolo can, can answer them in uh, whichever order he prefers. Um, Marco Drobniak writes, amazing talk related to previous question using word war was a really common thing. There was a word, a, a war with the virus, the media, constitutional court, and so on. Uh, but here's the question. How do you see uh, the relation between fake news, filter bubbles, and metaphors in addressing uh, voters on social media campaigns? So um, the role of metaphors in, in these things that have become so important, these kind of media dimensions of the media that have become so important in, in, in um, the last few years. And then uh, Simona Lescovar also writes here, uh, is it important who uses the metaphor in political discourse? Can the metaphor, uh, can a metaphor be used by a stronger, or can a metaphor used by a stronger, more powerful party be more effective, uh, even more dangerous? Can a metaphor even start a war or conflict? So there's uh, a lot to answer. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you to both uh, uh, to both of the um, uh, to both of the questions. Uh, to Marco's questions, uh, I have to say that I primarily mm, see metaphors. I, I wouldn't. Um, uh, I wouldn't compare them, and, and I guess Mark is also not saying that. I'm just saying this uh, uh, because it needs to be said. Uh, metaphors are not. This is not about fake news. Uh, fake news is completely. Uh, it's completely something else. Uh, metaphors. Uh, metaphors are something that we're using daily. Uh, it's. Uh, uh, it's very clear that we can. We cannot live in non-metaphorical uh, world. Because all of our uh, because all of our thinking is basically uh, metaphorically uh, structured. So uh, these metaphors, uh, so these metaphors uh, work uh, mainly as setting the the, uh, the scene. Uh, I see it. Uh, I see it that way, as setting the scheme, as setting the uh, the cognitive. You know how people think. How um, uh, how people then first the thing then behave uh, how they are uh, how they are supposed to uh, uh, how do you uh, how they are supposed to uh, behave so I don't see them primarily connected with as Marco is saying uh, fake news filter bubbles um, and so on uh, in addressing uh, in addressing voters. Because uh, metaphors are not just used on uh, or in social media, in social media campaigns, but they are basically used in not just also not just in political language, but in everyday political language. And uh, I don't see them, at least in Slovenian political discourse, I don't see them abused. Uh, in if if that was the uh, if that was the question, it's just the use. Now, whether it's effective or not, uh, it very much depends on uh, it. Very much depends on who you uh, who you basically uh, who you basically ask. So uh, the metaphors, in my the way I see them, are uh, uh, setting the uh, setting the discourse, and then of course within the discourse, uh, these things uh, uh, these things uh, happen. But maybe one thing. Uh, what we tend to forget, and what also the linguistic uh, theory tended to forget, uh, is or obscure really, is what this is all about. It's all about power. Okay, so it's about power relations that uh, uh, that 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 matter, and you effectively use metaphors or any other devi devices uh, uh, devices in language in political language for the sake of political power because this is this is what we are uh, this is what we are talking about and marco will know uh, also what i am uh, what i'm talking about. and this relates also to uh, to what the uh, ambassador uh, of slovenia um, uh, asked and that is uh, yes it is extremely important uh, uh, who is using uh, who is using the uh, the metaphor Part of the analysis uh, of the metaphor uh, of the metaphorical analysis is always uh, from which position, from which, uh, 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 from which, um, you know, what is the either institutional or non-institutional uh, position, 
uh, this person uh, is uh, is uttering the um, uh, the uh, the metaphors. Uh, obviously, uh, this is where also where power relations uh, come into play, where differences in uh, in power come uh, into play, and this is also where we uh, where when we analyze what is what is going on. We also we also say who is uttering these uh, these metaphors, who is using them, from which institutional position is using them, because that matters. It matters a lot. And uh, um, uh, yes, so metaphors, if used effectively, are also uh, are also uh, basically a, uh, a power struggle. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is. This is a discursive. Uh, this is a discursive uh, power uh, power struggle. Right, but um, depending on the circumstances, the and, and the political context, uh, it seems you know um, the wrong metaphor or the use of a certain metaphor can also backfire, right? And and it seems you know uh, obviously governments want to build their constituencies and 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 they want to build their their you know electoral bases and. Um, you know, uh, as it, well, I don't know uh, when, how, how things will shake up when Slovenia has its next, next elections, but, um, but it, it, it does present a rather divided picture at the moment. So. Yeah, uh, this is, this is exactly when I was, you know, when, when, when I was trying to present, uh, uh, when I was trying to present that, uh, if you don't make it, if, well, it's, it's, you know, if, if you make a wrong metaphors, then you might uh, you might get with the effect that is uh, that is detrimental to what you are uh, to what you're actually seeking, and uh, yes, uh, one needs to be very 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 careful in steering uh, in steering that discourse, and uh, what he or she is doing uh, is doing with that. Yeah, we didn't. I mean, we didn't talk about the sort of um, uh, uh, the the gendered aspect of some of these metaphors, but it seems that it's also important when thinking about these kind of bellicose and martial metaphors, you know, a kind of show of, of masculine strength, but, but it can also, uh, it can also backfire. Um, Thank you so much for pointing it out. Uh, I actually thought about it, didn't want to, uh, didn't want to, um, I didn't include it. But uh, thank you so much for uh, for pointing it out because that's a part of this. Uh, when I was uh, explaining uh, effectiveness, seriousness, uh, and so on, you know, all uh, all of these traditionally masculine traits, and uh, so it's yes, it's the uh, it's the masculinity, uh, it's the masculinity uh, in those uh, in those metaphors and the uh, the use uh, the use of them in the sense. Great. Um, we we might have time for a, a very uh, last short question. If if there are any from the audience, we are coming up to the end of our uh, time here. Uh, and here comes something from uh, Anna Semerov. Looking at the first and second wave of the pandemic in Slovenia, you mentioned war metaphors becoming less effective through time. Do you think this would have a more lasting effect if there wouldn't be as many affairs as there was with the current government. And also looking at the other side, the protesters, do you think they would be using a different tone of language if the discord of the government would be less, if the discourse of the government would be less war oriented? Um, yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, uh, thank you, Anna, as well. Um, Yes, I do think uh, uh, I do think uh, uh, the second wave would be uh, would be different. At least when we, when we uh, when we look at uh, when we look at um, uh, how people were reacting, uh, how people were uh, how people were reacting, how much rebellion was there, how was that uh, uh, how was that uh, managed, and uh, and uh, and so on. So uh, I think yes, it would be uh, it would be different. I also think uh, when you look comparatively, if from the very beginning the other uh, the other metaphors are maybe of more unity, uh, you know, uh, of uh, different type of uh, different type of metaphors uh, was used, we can speculate. Obviously, this is a uh, this is a speculation, 
but we can speculate that the uh, that the public would react uh, that the public would react uh, differently. Uh, it is a known fact that has been made by uh, by our uh, very very prominent uh, sociologist Renata Seletzl, uh, and that is you know uh, people rebel if you uh, if if you ask them to follow the rules, but then you are not following, uh, and then you are not following the rules. And uh, that's been uh, that's been practically uh, that's been practically um, everywhere. Um, with the protesters, um, what I miss, you know, I'll, you know, you know what I miss. I miss metaphor. I use uh, I miss uh, an effective uh, an effective metaphor that would steer people's uh, that that would that would try to tell to the people. Uh, that it's not just rebellion, but also that there is a plan. If there is a plan, I don't, uh, uh, I don't know. So you see, you see, even even the protesters could have, should have, uh, you know, could have had uh, more, uh, maybe more effective, uh, more, more, maybe more effective uh, use of metaphor, different tone of language, uh, uh, and uh, also them, I think, would react, uh, would react differently. Uh, if uh, if uh, if the initial discourse would be less war oriented. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm afraid we're we're out of time. It's been a, a terrific talk and and great discussion. Thank you um, again, Professor Piccolo, and thank you all for participating.